Thinking with the Church will be presented by Father John Zulsdorf, commonly known as Father Z. Father Z was ordained by St. John Paul II in 1991. He spent seven years serving the church on the Ecclesia Dei Commission. He's been a contributing writer for many publications and gives presentations for events for Legatus and the Napa Institute. And I just learned it sounds like he's a good cook. He's probably more widely known for his blog, Father Z's blog, from which you can read uh, his insights. Uh, you can learn from him. You can be inspired. Uh, you can read from the comments and the questions on his site that clergy are inspired by him, religious are inspired by him, and the lay faithful are inspired by him. So it's my pleasure tonight to introduce Father Z. Thank you very much for the, the very warm welcome. And uh, it's always wonderful to see Father Sirico. And now I get a chance to see the parish. I've heard a little bit about it and what he's been doing. And um, I'm really going to, I'm sure, enjoy my, my weekend here. Uh, part of the welcome included a question in the back from a, from a gentleman who came up to me and said that uh, he had seen in a, a tweet out there in the tweetosphere that uh, I had died. And uh, I was actually, um, I was a, a, a character in a science fiction book recently, by name, Father John Zolsdorf. And um, I got killed in the book. And uh, so I, this, is, this is probably the only time uh, in my whole life I'll have a chance to use this line. Reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. <laughs> so here I am. Okay, Sentiri Cum Ecclesia, to think with the church, is what our topic of discussion is tonight. Uh, back in May of 2014, Pope Francis addressed some women religious in Rome. They were gathered for a meeting of the International Union of Superiors General. And this was at a time when there was a lot of noise in the press about how the mean old Vatican and the bishops were treating the LCWR, you know, the Leadership Conference of Women Religious. And in his address, the Pope used a phrase in Italian, sentire con la chiesa. Now, Italian sentire means a range of things, but the phrase points to sensing your way, trying to discern, feel, or apprehend with the church. It has to do with aligning your mind and heart and will with what the church thinks and wills. I choose think with the church to underscore that we must always keep the rational dimension of the sensing front and center. Now here's what Francis said to the nuns. Finally, the ecclesial aspect, as one of the constitutive dimensions of the consecrated life, he's talking to them, of course, you know, what it is to be a religious, and he knows something about this because he was a Jesuit. Uh, dimensions of the consecrated life, a dimension which means be constantly recovered and deepened in life. Your vocation is a fundamental charism through the journey of the church, and it is not possible that a consecrated woman or man do not think with the church which gave birth to us in baptism, a thinking with the church, which finds itself, which finds its filial expression in fidelity to the magisterium in communion with the shepherds and the successor of Peter, Bishop of Rome, visible sign of unity. It, he goes on to say, it is, and he's quoting Pope Paul VI now to this group of international group of women religious, in the context of a time when they're all this, all this hubbub about how the mean old Vatican is treating the nuns you know, so badly. He says, it is an absurd dichotomy to think, to live outside the church, to love Jesus without living and loving the church. So in sum, the centrality of his message was we have to align ourselves always with how the church thinks and wills. We have to conform our will to the church's will in a certain way, to think with the church, to sense, apprehend, conform oneself with the church. 
So the Holy Father, Pope Francis, and this is something that I think it's salutary for some people in the more traditional uh, side of things. I think they need to hear this again and again and again. The Holy Father thinks that fidelity to doctrine is of key importance. Now at the National Catholic Reporter back in May, that's a newspaper commonly used to wrap fish and line various things. The, at the, the, the fish wrap back in, in May of 2014, the editors cobbled up a clucking editorial, uh, kind of an open letter to Pope Francis. They had a little nutty over the meaning, over the mean old Vatican, how they were treating these consciously evolved sisters in the uh, LCWR. You can pretty much guess the content. You know, Cardinal Mueller of the Congregation for Doctrine of the Faith, bad, you know, men. Uh, the, the, the women of the LCW are good. That was the, you know, the hermeneutic is, you know, men are mean and you know, women are wonderful and the, the institutional church is bad, but we're the prophetic church, that sort of thing. Well, in this uh, editorial, this clucking editorial, uh, they, I think, misused this term, sentire cum ecclesia, that's the Latin version of what the Holy Father said earlier in Italian. Uh, they said, the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith asks aloud if the LCWR's focus on the new ideas, uh, its focus on new ideas, robs it of the ability to feel with the church. Now, what's interesting is that in Cardinal Mueller's talking about this whole context of the women religious. He didn't use the, he didn't use the phrase uh, sentire con la chiesa in Italian. He quoted the Latin, sentire cum ecclesia. But I go on. Um, uh, this, uh, he asks aloud if the LCWR's focus on new ideas robs it of the ability to feel with the church, right? To feel with the church. That's how they chose to translate it. Okay, because it is because the LCWR feels with the church that it is exploring these new ideas. You know, this is like conscious evolution, bringing yourself into the great oneness of being, moving beyond the church, beyond Christ and all that. Well, a failure to explore what is new will cripple the church's mission in the years ahead. Like it or not, change is the norm of contemporary society, right? Well, change is the norm of contemporary society, therefore it has to be the, the norm of the church, too, I suppose. Cha expressing changeless teachings requires new understandings and articulations. Apparently, these are understandings and articulations that really have very little to do with the changeless teachings, but I digress. They want the church to conform to prevailing culture. Now, we have to drill in now to what Sentire whom Ecclesia means, where it comes from. Uh, because we'll, we're often going to hear, when we see this phrase, we'll see it sometimes twisted or used as a justification for some very odd ideas, which I don't believe are, are Catholic at all. Uh, one problem that we have is when they suddenly, without any other content, uh, on, uh, other context or, or distinction, turn it into feel. This is a legitimate way to approach sentire, to feel with the church. It is, but only once you get all of the other components right. And we have to dig into some of those. And there are some difficulties in translating the phrase and because we have to pack this word, this, this word sentire in Latin can mean a whole range of things. And unfortunately, when we are translating things from Latin into English, we have to make choices. And we're going to lose some content along the way. So that's why a, a discussion like the we're going to have now, just throwing some, some ideas out for you, some hooks to hang some ideas on, will prepare you for when you hear or see this phrase, sentire cum ecclesia, to think or feel with the church. So let's start with the meaning of the words themselves. Now, in Italian, as I mentioned before, sentire has a stronger line of meaning in the senses and feeling, hearing, smelling, and so forth. But the phrase is not originally Italian. I suspect that the LCWR types and the fish wrap types, uh, not given to using Latin all that much, 
uh, didn't drill very far into the phrase. The, in Latin, sentio, sentio, if you use your classical pronunciation, means to discern by the senses, be sensible of, in that case it would be like percipio, but it also has the sense of intelligo, to observe, to notice, to judge, to deem. For example, there's a construction in Latin, and this is exactly the construction that we're interested in here in this phrase, sentire cum aliquo, which means to agree with someone, to agree with someone in their opinion, right? To be in agreement with them. And if you were to walk up to say someone, you know, for example, even, even later on, uh, Sancte, sanctissime paterb, um, tecum sentio, you know, I, I entirely agree with you, uh, most holy father. Um, well, you would be speaking exactly like Plautus or Cicero or Quintilian. That's a very common phrase. So if you have to cast your lot with one English word for sentire in the phrase sentire cum ecclesia, I think you'd have to pick out think or agree and not feel. That's not the right way to go. That is not to say that, ev that emotions are excluded and that this is all very uber rationalist. The governing concept, however, is the mind, not emotions. Emotions come along under the tutelage of the mind and will. So, how about this phrase, sentire cum ecclesia? Does it have a history, or did it spring full blown out of the, the head of someone recently? Well, it has its origin in Ignatian spirituality, the spirituality of the founder of the Jesuits, with which we can, I think, safely assume Pope Francis being a Jesuit has, has some familiarity. So when he was using that phrase again and again with the sisters, I think he had something in mind. Sentire cum ecclesia is straight out of St. Ignatius's spiritual exercises. There's a heading in the back part of it where he presents, where he's presenting various rules. For example, uh, how to give alms, how to give alms properly, how to give alms for the right reason, the right measure, to the right person and the right motive and so forth. He presents various rules uh, in different categories to help you with your spiritual life. Well, he has one section called Ad sentiendum verisicut debemus cum ecclesia militante servento regule sequentes, which means to have the true sentiment, the true thought and sentiment which we ought to have in the church militant let the following rules be observed. Well, I note, uh, of course, that he's talking about the church militant, which all of us are a member of. Uh, we know the distinction of the triumphant church and the suffering church, the souls in purgatory, and we are here in the church militant, like soldiers on the march. And this is, of course, a, uh, an image which would be very appropriate for Ignatian spirituality coming out of his soldierly background as he did, especially in a time of ecclesiological war and theological war over uh, Christian identity that was raging in Europe at the time. So he presents a whole bunch of rules. And in one of these rules, we have this sentire cum ecclesia. I'll, I will, let me just give you a sample of what these rules are like. Uh, if you're interested in something, you know, the contrast of the sort of thing we've heard about the spiritual life over the last, I don't know, say 52 years, just as a, you know, a number to throw out. <laughs> and, um, you know, what we heard for centuries. Well, here's the first rule. All judgment laid aside, we ought to have our mind ready and prompt to obey in all the true spouse of Christ our Lord, which is our Holy Mother, the Church, hierarchical. Yeah. So when Pope Francis is quoting Sintiricum Ecclesia, or Cardinal Mueller is 
talking about sentire cum ecclesia in reference to women religious, and that was you know, one particular context, what's going on with women religious in the world, and they start quoting sentire cum ecclesia, this has to come to mind, these rules in which that phrase sentire cum ecclesia reappears and really enters into Christian parlance. Here's the fifth rule. To praise vows of religion, of obedience, there's that pesky word again, of poverty, of chastity, and of other perfections of supererogation. And it is to be noted that as the vow is about the things which approach to evangelical perfection, a vow ought not to be made in the things which withdraw from it, such as to be a merchant or to be, in this case, married, etc. The ninth rule, finally, Finally, to praise all precepts of the church, keeping the mind prompt to find reasons in their defense and in no manner against them. This is interesting. One of the precepts of the church is to follow the church's laws concerning marriage, right? And that is a hot topic right now among theologians as we get ready for this uh, synod in Rome that's going to take place in October and they're going to talk very, about various aspects of the family but marriage uh, and whether or not the uh, divorced and civilly remarried are able to receive Holy Communion things like this are going to be are going to be coming up the thirteenth rule this is a fun one it's the famous this is the famous one out of that set of rules to be right in everything we ought always to hold that the white which I see is black, if the hierarchical church so decides it, believing that between Christ our Lord, the bridegroom, and the church, his bride, there is the same spirit which governs and directs us for the salvation of our souls. Because by the same spirit and our Lord who gave the Ten Commandments, our Holy Mother, the church, is directed and governed. There are many more rules along this line but basically he's saying if the holy if holy church tells you that white is black you should believe that white is black that's the literal reading of that i don't think he really intended that as a to be literally taken in exactly that way but jesuits were especially supposed to um obey perinde ac cadaver just like a corpse the idea is that they have no will of their own, that the superiors will become their own will, and conforming themselves to the church and conforming themselves to their superiors' will, that's a path to, uh, to sanctity, and it's a way to serve the church in a, in a very special way. And so if, they, um, you know, if the church says jump, you ask how high while you're on your way up, you see. This is the kind of obedience that... that Ignatius is talking about. He's not actually trying to make your, you lie to yourself about black being white because it's self-evident. Hmm? Okay, but so that is, that's, that gives us a little bit of context about what the sentire cum ecclesia really means. That we may be all together of the same mind and in conformity with the church herself. If she shall have defined anything to be black, which, in which our eyes appears to be white, we ought in like manner to pronounce it to be black, for we must undoubtedly believe. And that's another translation of that whole thing. So, obviously, Ignatius is writing in a spiritual, of, uh, in a context of war, uh, but what Ignatius is driving at is a love of the church so great that you will submit yourself to whatever she teaches you, even though it be very difficult. And so we can find now, grope around for a few other ways to, to understand sentire cum ecclesia. We can, trans, we can translate it maybe as conforming with the church. Uh, in old manuscripts of the spiritual exercises, we read uh, that uh, translations of it, we read, uh, to have the sentiment of the church, as I used in that when I was giving the, the heading for all those rules. And that doesn't mean sentimentality. That's too feeling-based. But 
just as I warned that we're not going to, you know, be overly rationalistic with this phrase and just, you know, chalk it down to, you know, pure intellect without feeling, the late Richard John Newhouse uh, brought, brings us back to the affective dimension of this when he talked about what sentire cum ecclesia means. And I'll quote him here. It means to think with the church, but also to feel with the church. In short, to love the church. If we love the church as a lover loves the beloved, then we will her to be. We will her to flourish. We will her to succeed in the mission she has been given by Christ. As in a good marriage, the Catholic never thinks I without thinking we. It is necessary to cultivate this communion of shared devotion, affection, and purpose in a very disciplined way. For not all aspects of the church are lovable, just as we are not always lovable. Nonetheless, we are loved by the church and most particularly by all the saints in the church triumphant. Centuria cum ecclesia means being concerned never to betray St. Paul, St. Irenaeus, St. Augustine, St. Thomas, St. Teresa, and the faith for which they and innumerable others lived and died, and for all the inadequacies and sins of the church and her leadership in our time. It means always doing one's best to support and never to undermine the effectiveness of her teaching ministry. She is, after all, the bearer and embodiment of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is nothing less than the story of the world, without which the world, and we with it, is lost. Thus Richard John Newhouse on bringing together the thinking aspect of Sentire Cum Ecclesia with the feeling aspect. And he looks at this through the lens or through the hermeneutic of love. And I think that's exactly how we have to put it. The late Jesuit theologian and Cardinal Avery Dulles explained Sentire Cum Ecclesia along these lines to give us yet another lens through which we can peer. Have you been to the, you've been to the, the what, do you, what do you call it, optometrist, right? Optometrist, and they put this thing right up against your face and you start turning lenses and still, and then which one, is it clearer this way? Click, click this way, right? Click that way. Some of you don't, are, are not cursed with glasses. Well, I, I just went through this process here and I don't know what I think about it. I feel like Harry Potter standing up in here, these things, but the um, Avery Dulles, explained Sentire Cum Ecclesia along these lines. I have never tried to create a system of my own, an individual theology. What is specific, if you want to call it that, is that I simply want to think in communion with the faith of the church. And that means, above all, to think in communion with the great thinkers of the faith. The aim is not an isolated theology that I draw out of myself, but one that opens as widely as possible into the common intellectual pathways of the faith. And so there's a continuity dimension to thinking with the church. We can be rational about it, we can feel about it, but we have to be deeply aware of who we are as a church going all the way back. That we are receivers of something that has been handed on. And so we have I think an understanding of Sentire Cum Ecclesia, thinking with the church, is a deeply thoughtful and loving submission to what the church holds always and everywhere to be true. But we can still dig into this, drill into this marvelous phrase just a little deeper using another phrase which is related, and that is sensus fidelium, the sense of the faithful, and then related phrases such as sensus fidei, the sense of the faith, and even sensus fidei fidelium, right? The sense of the faith of the faithful. And even finally, the consensus fidelium, 
the consensus of the faithful. In other words, how things which Holy uh, Church teaches are received. Uh, we may not have time to get into that, but I thought I would also bring that up as an important dimension of this. The limits of my time here do not permit me to get into the particulars of the origins of this sensus fidei, that phrase, sense, the sense of the faith. So I'll direct your attention to a document recently issued by the International Theological Commission, which operates in a sort of, sort of in the shadow of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. The, doctrine, uh, the document is called Sensus Fidei, in the life of the church. So if you want to learn something about sensus fide and the origin of the phrase, you can go back and look and see where some of the biblical roots and patristic roots and this thought and medieval period going up through the, the Reformation, post-Reformation. It's very useful. It's a little long. Uh, it's 20,000 words in length. And uh, the people who put this together uh, swung at a lot of pitches uh, in creating it, but they got some real good hits with it. Um, it is not a magisterial document. Uh, it was not issued by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, even though the International Theological Commission operates under the shadow of the congregation. Uh, so we can, we can take this document or we can leave it. But it's decidedly not nothing, right? And we shouldn't just ignore it. Uh, in, so I'm just going to stop uh, for a moment to touch on, a, on, a, on an image, and this is uh, something you can read a little bit more in depth in this document I mentioned, Census Fide in the Life of the Church. You can find it on the Vatican website. Just when you, when you, if you're looking for it, go to the section where it says Roman Curia and then Congregations and then uh, Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and it'll show you then a link to the International Theological Commission. You can get it in English. You don't have to read it in Italian. Unless you want to, um, Father. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll bring up uh, one section in here that, that is spun out more at length in that document. Uh, Blessed John Henry Newman wrote an essay called On Consulting the Faithful in Matters of Doctrine. Now for Newman, the lay faithful have their own distinct and active role to play in preserving and handing on the faith. What was passed by the apostles as tradition unto us handed, handed on to the whole church. And if there's one, have you ever gone into a, a, a garage where there's a workshop or down maybe a basement workshop where, you know, the man or woman who puts it together, it's usually a man, put it, puts it together and he actually he has hooks up on the wall for tools and maybe has even drawn the shape of the tool on the wall, you know, so that you always get the tool right back in the right spot. I see a couple of guilty parties over here. That's a very good thing. You, know, you, keep, you keep all your tools, everything orderly, right? You want your thoughts orderly. So you, know, you can look at some of these things that I'm tossing out to you as hooks on the wall of your mind where you can hang ideas and keep them in order so that as you go out tonight, just like, you know, after leaving a Broadway show whistling the tune, you know, you can be repeating to yourself phrases, you know, that are used during the, the talk. Well, um, the whole church is, I think, one of the important ones. The whole church. For Newman, the whole church has a role in preserving and handing on the faith. The constituents of the church bear witness to it in different ways, however. Newman said that tradition, and I quote here, manifests itself variously at various times, sometimes by the mouth of the episcopacy, sometimes by the doctors, sometimes by the people, sometimes by liturgies, ceremonies, and customs, by events, disputes, movements, and all those other phenomena which are comprised under the name of history. For Newman, there is, and I'll quote here again, there is something in the pastorum et fidelium conspiratio, which is not in the pastors alone. This image of conspiratio, 
Sounds like conspiracy, right? Conspiratio. It means a breathing together. You can think of, you can maybe remember this in the, in the idea of a conspiracy, if they're all, you know, like whispering together, they're kind of like breathing together in a little corner, right? They're breathing, conspiratio is a breathing together. And this image of conspiratio, of the pastors and of the faithful, pastorum et fidelium conspiratio, emerged around the time of the proclamation of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. You know, it just occurred to me that on the wall of my guest room over in the rectory, there's a, a beautiful image of John Henry Newman uh, done very much in the style of an Eastern icon. And in it, the blessed uh, John Henry is holding a tablet on which it is written, the voice of the whole church will in time make itself heard. There's the whole church. I thought that was a, a nice, uh, to be under the aegis of John Henry Newman as I was pulling out my notes. I looked up and there it was, right there. He was talking about exactly the kind of this thing in that, in that icon. So, um, so this image of conspiratio, this breathing together, uh, emerged at the time of the announcement of the, of the uh, doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. So what happened here? How did this come about? Well, um, there was a strong, the Pope uh, Pius IX had a strong sense that the entire church had to be consulted in this matter of the proclamation of the dogma. And he had been very much inspired by a theologian by the name of Giovanni Perrone, who came up with this phrase. He was using this image of the conspiratio, uh, pastorum et fidelium. And so influenced by the research of this theologian on how of the interplay between the faithful and, and pastors, with the hierarchy, determined that he would write to all the bishops and ask the bishops of the world to report back to him about the devotion and the piety of the faithful. And the faithful in this was not only the lay faithful, but also the, uh, the bishops and the priests themselves, all of the faithful. And he referred in his proclamation, in Ephabilis Deus, of 1854, that there was a singularis catholicorum antistitum ac fidelium conspiratio. He used the phrase conspiratio right in his uh, document about the, the proclamation of the dogma. There is a, 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 a special, a singularis, a, a particular, an outstanding uh, breathing together of the Catholic bishops and the faithful. And so Newman, when he was writing about consulting the faithful in the matters of the faith, he also took up this phrase, conspiratio. So the breathing together image is useful for helping us avoid a trap when talking about the sense of the faithful, the sensus fidei, and also sentire cum ecclesia. Because the ecclesia is not just the pope and the bishops and priests and religious. Sometimes when you open up a diocesan newspaper or you go to Catholic websites, just about the only thing you see is about what this bishop is doing or what the bish the, this, these priests are doing or what the Pope is doing. And you, you get a sense after a while, kind of a subtle sense that when you're talking about the church, you're talking about the guys who are up there in front. And that's, I think we have to avoid this trap. At the same time, I think we have to avoid the other extreme of downplaying the role of the hierarchy and assuming that the church is just bottom up, it's just the lay faithful and the, the priests, bishops, pope play this re very reduced role if they have much a role at all other than perhaps just to, conf to confirm us in our own warm you know, self-impressions or you know, whatever it is that, that that they do in some places, I don't know. So the church is not just the hierarchy, the church is not just the faithful, the church is both hierarchy and laity together, breathing 
together. The sensus fidei fidelium, the sense of the faith of the faithful, when we use that or hear that or think in this term, we must not fall into the trap of hearing the lay faithful when we hear the word the faithful. The faithful includes the hierarchy. When we use this very often, how, you know, think about this. I have to at times force myself to not to stumble into that trap when I talk about the faithful as if that automatically means just the laity. The faithful out there. No, no. I'm a member of the faithful too. I have a different role. Father has a different role. The bishop has a different role. We're all members of the faithful, but we have different roles here. So, yes, sometimes we use the faithful as a kind of a shorthand for the laity, but I think we have to be very careful with that because it can lead to a false dichotomy. The faithful are all the faithful, lay and also the hierarchy breathing together. And so if the body is trying to breathe with only one lung, it's really in trouble. So in the 20th century, in the 20th century, Pope Pius XII also consulted all the bishops of the world, asking them to report about the devotion of your clergy and people taking into account their faith and piety toward the assumption of the most blessed Virgin Mary. The Second Vatican Council, working in part from the insights of the Dominican theologian Yves Congar, issued a dogmatic constitution on the church called Lumen Gentium. And Lumen Gentium talks about the whole people of God before it makes distinctions about clergy and laity. And so in Lumen Gentium paragraph 12, talking about the sensus fidei, the sense of the faith, we read that the whole body of the faithful cannot err in matters of faith. The Holy Spirit maintains a supernatural appreciation of the faith when the whole people, from the bishops to the last of the faithful, manifest a universal consent in manners of faith and morals. And so the lay faithful play a role in maintaining and transmitting the faith. In the Council's document Dei Verbum on divine revelation, the very phrase used in the Marian dogma is, is, was brought back out, the singularis fiat antistitum et fidelium conspiratio, that special, that particular breathing together of the bishops and of the faithful. Now, at this point, I have to give you another hook for your tool wall. We have to introduce another distinction. Just as the magisterium itself has reiterated over the decades since the council to a greater and lesser degree of success, depending on who you talk to. Uh, this is something that's become more and more an issue, I think, with the rise of mass media and the, the tool of communication. We're all living in an information age now. We have, to, we have to be very wary of, we have to be on the watch for, vigilant about any confusion of the sensus fidei with popular opinion, either inside the church or outside the church. Let's not confuse sensus fidei with popular opinion, either inside the church or outside the church. St. John Paul II, in his post synodal exhortation, Familiaris Consortio, in 1981 already, he touched on the question of how the faith is received by the people, how the supernatural sense of faith is related to the consensus, the consent of the faithful. Therefore, John Paul underscored the urgencies of pastors to teach properly and to examine and judge the genuous, genuineness of expressions of the faith. In 1990, there was a document from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith called Donum Veritatis, which concerned the ecclesial vocation of the theologian. This is a document that's dear to my heart. I'm sure you all have your own favorite um, congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith documents. And this is one of my favorites. Um, the reason why is when in, in 1990 I was working in the 
in the building where the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith is housed. Uh, that's where the Pontifical Commission Ecclesia Dei was. And so I would run into um, Cardinal Ratzinger with great frequency. And um, one day, uh, in 1990 as it turned out, uh, I ran into him and I said, well, Your Eminence, I read the, uh, read the document on the ecclesial vocation of the theologian. And he, like the German teach, professor that he, always, that he never stopped being, a very kind man, kindest man on the face of the earth, he said, well, what did you think about it? And I said, well, Your Eminence, I wasn't really happy with it. He <laughs> wasn't expecting that answer. And so he said, why not? I said, well, you go on for page and page after page after page, but you don't really tell us who a theologian is, do you? And he considered that for a little bit. And he said to me, well, why don't you tell us? <laughs> How would your eminence suggest I tell you? He said, well, you're studying at the Augustinianum, which is the Patristic Institute. My background is in the Fathers of the Church. And so you're studying at the Patristic Institute. Why don't you ask St. Augustine, who a theologian is? And that became my thesis, right? So. You know, it's interesting. You never know what's going to spark from one of these wonderful CDF documents. You should all have your own, your favorites. Maybe you know, trade them like, you know, like baseball cards or I don't know. But this is one of my favorite, Donum Veritatis, about the ecclesial vocation of the theologian. So in this document, the CDF warned about equating the sensus fidei, the sense of the faith, with the opinion of a large number of Christians. Sensus fidei is, prop, is a property of the theological virtue of faith, which is a gift of God that makes it possible for a Christian to adhere to what the church believes. Not all opinions held by believers spring from faith. And since many people are swayed by public opinion, it is necessary to emphasize the indissoluble bond between the sensus fidei and the guidance of God's people by the magisterium of the pastors. So in this, this paragraph 35, as I'm sure you'll be whistling on the way home, again we see here the intimate bond of lay faithful and hierarchy together, not to be separated. They have different roles, but uh, they're together. And so we see an emerging d distinction here about the sensus fide and by analogy, the meaning of the phrase we started with, sentire cum ecclesia, to think with the church. Namely, that the sensus of the faithful has to be faithful in conformity with the gospel and with apostolic faith properly handed down. And this allows the faithful, the faithful faithful, a kind of spiritual instinct about what is true and what is not, what is Catholic and what is not, what is of the faith and what isn't. This instinct is rather like a virtue. It's a habit in a person that is developed over time, a kind of it, it, it functions almost like a, like a spontaneous sixth sense, which helps a person see rightly, even in situations that are very complicated. Unlike theology, which is a, a, the, the scientia, it's, a, it's more like a science, the sensus fidei is a spontaneous reaction, a knack, uh, an instinct to conform to what is of the faith and to reject what is contrary to the faith. So you can see the intimate connection of the theological virtue of faith and the sensus fidei. The state of grace is a powerful component in the sensus fidei. You know, you can learn all sorts of things about the faith, and we, but we have to make a distinction about the faith, right? We can think about the faith the, that has content and then the faith by which we believe. In Latin we put this as a fides qua creditur, a faith by which we believe in the fides qua created the, the faith in which we believe. Well, the, the faith has content, and we can learn. We can pick up our catechism of the Catholic Church. Or we can pick up documents of the Church. We can learn them, study them, talk about them, discuss them, deepen our understanding of their historical context. We can learn all these things. We can learn formulae, like we did as children in catechism. We can learn the content of the faith, 
But beyond that, the true content of the faith is a person. The true content is Jesus Christ, right? And he gives us a gift, a supernatural gift, when we're baptized, the supernatural, the theological virtue of faith, by which we are enabled to believe things. And that has, that has a, there's an interplay between you know, our intellectual understanding of things and the faith by which we believe. So if you, you can learn really well your catechism and so forth, but if you're living for, for a long periods of time, not in the state of grace, this ability to discern that which is good and true and right concerning the faith and that which will get you to heaven is going to be terribly crippled and darkened. It's very important that we, that we understand that the state of grace is a powerful component of the sensus fidei. This sensus fidei not only uh, helps us to discern that which is good and true and Catholic and to adhere to it, but it also can warn people when they hear heresy being pre preached, even by their priest or by their bishop, and that, that, you know, that happens, right? The sensus fidei helps the faithful to resist false preaching or false ideas of this or that pastor, even when the person isn't exactly sure what it is that's bothering her, right? What, what did, there's something not right about this. Even if he or she can't explain it in really clear, concise terms, or point to this quote in a book, they kind of know there's something not right here. The sensus fide also helps people figure out what is more essential for the life of faith and what is less essential or peripheral this can be the case in certain matters of, for example, Marian devotions or reading uh, the spiritual musings of this person or that person, you know, and we get into the category of, you know, private revelations or, you know, whatever. Some things are more central to the faith and more important for us than others. And a sensus fidei can help us discern those things, even though we know that they're all interconnected. So the sensus fidei then also has... Uh, brings to the fore an aspect of prudence, which helps us to know the best way also to communicate the faith to others in the right way, in the right measure, at the right moment, with the right tone and words. How many times have we had an opportunity perhaps to help a person come back to the church or deal with some difficult problem and in maybe our zeal or you know whatever it is we blow it by using the wrong tone or pushing it at the wrong moment or you know what we we have to we have to be very sensitive to these things and the sense of fide can help you in this matter regard to help you prudently uh, to approach people, especially in the transmission of the faith. So there's preserving the faith, understanding, recognizing it, and also transmitting it. The development of doctrine and conspiratio. Let's see, I don't need to talk to you about the Council of Elvira in 306. I don't need to talk to you about the king. No, I don't need to talk to you about that. All right, I'm going to skip over that too. You know what? I'm going to cut to the chase here. I return, I'll return, circle back to what, uh, what Richard John Newhouse tried to uh, convey and what, um, also what Avery Dulles tried to convey, what Newman tried to convey. There's a we involved in the Sintire Cum Ecclesia that stands against individualism the faith in my membership in the church is not about me, even though I must struggle towards salvation on my own. I'm doing this with others. I'm doing it with everybody's help. We're all in this together from that point of view. But we don't cobble up something for ourselves in the church. I have this sole preference, and by God, it's the right one, and everybody else is wrong, is not something that is... Uh, I think in keeping with a proper sensus fidei, you're not 
conforming to the church very well that way. There's a we involved in this, the whole church. We have to learn to be obedient to the church. We have to learn how to be open and even set aside our own individual opinions uh, when we are being presented with something that is very difficult and hard to understand. And we do this out of love. We have to sacrifice something of our own will and something of our own desires so that we are not willful over and against the church who is our mother in trying to bring us to salvation. And uh, with that, I will just cordially thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Now, Father, questions. We get five minutes. All right. Okay, and then after that, um, if you have questions, you find Father, but someone keep us on track. Five minutes, and then we can break, we can talk, we can do that thing we like to do so well every month, and then you'll Good. close us in prayer. Okay. By the way, never underestimate the power of an, inv of an invitation. It can uh, change someone's life completely. Yes, sir. You're welcome. My question is, uh, Just stand up and let me hear what you're saying. Thanks. I have a question about obedience to the church in being in something in one of the church, um, especially in obedience to the EMT of the church. Um, there's, there's times in church history where um, even saints will, I think, be the church and be involved in the public. Yeah, well, look, um, the document that I mentioned, uh, Donum Veritatis, also touches on this. Uh, if, you're, if you're interested in especially how the church talks about theologians, how theologians should approach the church uh, when they have concerns about something or they're troubled about something, they're having a hard time understanding it, uh, Donum Veritatis lays out uh, also how uh, they, should, they should approach the church. Uh, to bring bring concerns to the fore. One of the ways I think we can obviously say is that you don't rush out and publish a book against what the church teaches, right? Because it creates scandal among the faithful. So in expressing your doubts about something, you have to make sure that you you don't do it in such a way that you might be harming the faith of others or the, the identity, Catholic identity of others, especially if they may be a little weak on some point. Because to drag uh, people into you know, error or defiance against the church is a really awful sin. So we have to be very careful not to commit scandal. But there are ways to do it. Now, you know, look, Joe Bag of Donuts out there who has a problem with some issue of the church maybe isn't, I think at a certain point he's got to recognize himself maybe as not being the best qualified to say, hey, the church is wrong, you know. I've given those 10 minutes of thought, you know, and I'm, I've come up with some really fascinating ideas that the church should listen to, right? You know, so that probably, that person probably isn't, you know, deeply qualified to, to raise it up. But there are others who are, you know, in the, in the academy, you know, the theologians and so forth, who, who there, there's a mechanism for them to bring up their concerns. Uh, so there we go. That we, it's important not to create scandal. Yes, ma'am.
Yeah, okay, right. Uh, if you're not getting what you need at your parish, do you vote with your feet and go to another parish? I don't, I don't have a good answer for that because uh, some people have uh, you know, children, they're worried about the, the forma spiritual formation of their children. Uh, they, they don't think they can get what they, they need from you know, this place or that place uh, sometime. One of the things, you know, one of the, one of the places, I think one of the most important places where our, our sensus fidei is built up and where we learn really to sentire cum ecclesia is in the context of the parish, especially in, the litur in our liturgical worship. And so that the way Holy Mass, for example, is celebrated, together with the, the content of the preaching, uh, is, is critically important for that. And there are lots of our brothers and sisters out there who are not getting a whole lot of, uh, a lot of help in that, you know, from the, 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 the liturgical action of the church. And so our instinct is to go and find that. Our sense of the faith drags us away from the place and maybe closest to which we live to some other place. And I think this is a big, there's a, there's a tension in the church right now about this very matter. Because according to the, to the church's law, we belong in a, in a territorial parish. The church is still divided up geographically. And you live in the bounds of a parish somewhere unless you're you know, a particular person who might be able to belong to a personal parish because of an ethnic background or some other issue. It's very territorial. On the other hand, there may be in the new code of canon law, uh, talking about parishes, there's an opening up for a new thought about this territoriality, this, this, this uh, confining uh, geographical view. Uh, when it defines a parish as a portion of the people of God without further explanations in that particular canon. Then it goes on and talks about the you know, territories later on. So it's still there. But we're in tension right now. In our society, we are very mobile. We can pick up and move very easily. And I think that this is a problem that we're going to have to sort through. So what are some of the elements here uh, that are intention? You want to be able to contribute to your parish and maybe help out, maybe turn things around, be a positive influence in the parish, bring things around. On the other hand, you need your own spiritual nourishment. You might be worried about the formation of those for whom you were responsible. Those things are intention, right? Your own desire and, you know, uh, at the same time, we have another dynamic. Do I just stay and wait this guy out? <laughs> right? Because now bishops seem to be assigning guys for only six years or maybe another renewable, you know, six years after that. Instead of the old way that it was done, you'd, you'd assign pastor for, a, for a, an undefined period of time, and a pastor could be there for 40 years, uh, possibly, which can work out really well or maybe not so well, depending on the guy, right? But, you, but, but what, you know, what the six-year thing and 12-year thing does is it eliminates the necessity of a bishop ever really to have to work things out with a pastor that he's disagreeing with. He could just wait him out. But if that's the case, then so can the laity. And that is also another problem. Are you really, you know, how do you, how do you participate in the life of the parish? Well, I don't, you know, I mean, every situation is going to be different here. However, one of the things that you can do is you can pray for the man or the people who are on the staff. You can fast for them. You can perform other mortifications, right? You can offer positive words of encouragement, especially when they do things that are, you know, good and right and true and, you know, according to their proper vocation. When, they're, when they've given you something that's really good and helpful, tell them, thank them. Treat them also like priests. That's a, that's a really important thing, too, because some of these guys came up in a, in a sort of for, formation where they may you know, have a confused notion of what priesthood is. Uh, when I was in seminary in the United States, before I went to Italy, I was in a place where we were forbidden to use the word priest. Right? Everyone was either an ordained minister or a non-ordained minister to confuse the roles between the, the, the priesthood of the faithful and the priesthood of the clergy. And so... Um, you know, Father and the people around him and the staff are going to be frail sinners just like we are. 
and they've got their own background, their own context that they came out of. You have to discern with that sensus fide and with all of your other intellectual lights and real patience. And asking also, you know, if you really you've got to work something out, start praying to the, start praying to Father's guardian angel, you know, to and your guardian angel to get together and maybe even on that plane to try to help work things out. You know, if there's a problem or something has to be moved in a good and wholesome direction. You know, no, no, uh, uh, no general universal uh, principle can be applied here other than just to, you know, be very smart, be very holy, be very patient, and then make the right, make the call that's going to be the one that's best for you and your, your salvation and the salvation of those who are under you. Um, yeah, you said five minutes, but we have more time. Uh, uh, yes, uh, the, the young, young man here, sorry, and then, and then, yes, the young man here, exactly. Yes, sir. Yes. Let us suppose. Well, um, first of all, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting supposition, but it's almost like saying, you know, what if God could make a rock so big that he couldn't lift? It's absurd. The synod is not going to do that. It just can't do that. Um, it, it will not, that kind of thing would not get through for even, it, it won't, that, that won't happen during the synod. But even if it does, the synod is not a, uh, is not a determinative body. They get together and they talk and they offer suggestions to the supreme pontiff, the vicar of Christ, the bishop of Rome, the servant of the servants of God, Francis, now gloriously reigning, and he takes those suggestions and he does exactly what he wants to with them. He can, he can go, wow, these are great, and then right, he'll go and then he'll you know, in his private study, throw these away and those away, and then he'll write a document, right, and summarize things in his own document, and then he'll write a post-synodal exhortation of some sort. And some of these post-synodal exhortations have been magnificent. Familiaris Consortio is one that I quoted tonight. That was a post-synodal exhortation by John Paul II. Francis, Francis is not going to take even, even if the synod did make a suggestion like this, you know, look, some, some bishop, you know, bishop, I don't know, Sven, Sven O'Reilly of the Bishop of Black Duck can stand up in this thing and say, well, I think we should be distributing condoms from the loggia of St. Peter's. He would be hooted down. He would be shouted down. Uh, in no time, I mean, he would be the laughing stock of the entire episcopus. So there's, there's no way that's going to happen. There will be some slithery kind of discussions and, you know, little, little insinuations about, oh, we have to have new solutions in these modern times, you know, some solution, we have, to, we have to find it even though it may be challenging. That's the kind of language they use. You know, after a while, hearing that sort of language, everybody knows what they're talking about. They're like, oh, sit down, and then they, you know, move on to the next point. And everyone is going to stand up there, and they're going to talk for five minutes, you know, make their, their thing, you know, their thing that's going to be in the Servitore Romano the next day. Big deal, right? That, that's what this is. You know, they get together, and it's yak, yak. So then they get suggestions together, and then committees, right? For God so loved the world that he did not send a committee. They have a committee of the members of the synod. You know, there, there's a book out right now, a, like a management book that I'm dying to get my hands on and read. It's called Death by Meeting, you know. And what they're going to do is they'll have committees then uh, that will read the... Um, they call them interventions, the little speeches made by the bishops and the various experts that they bring in to talk to the bishops about, you know, question X or Y or Z. Uh, well, hopefully not about Z, but um, the X and Y. And um, then these committees will put together 
they'll try to summarize it up by the end of the synod into different points, like bullet points. Well, the synod talked about this point and that point and this point, made some suggestions, here's some suggestions, and then they hold, hand this over to the Holy Father. And then he does and it, what, exactly what he wants to with it. And there's no way that this man is going to, you know, change doctrine. He's not going to do it. A lot of people, I think, think that he might, but he's not. They've completely misread him if they think that he is, you know, so, going to do something like that. Francis, no way. Absolutely no way. So don't worry about the synod. <laughs> don't worry about the synod. The, the, the dynamics surrounding the synod are going to be much more interesting. But right now, I think you, what we're going to see is, you know, a, a, a little while ago, Cardinal Walter Casper came out with a book um, where he raises all these ideas about mercy towards these people who are in difficult situations. And we're all for mercy, aren't we? You know, I'm not against mercy. Are you against mercy? Yeah, I'm not against mercy. But anybody who then starts to say, no, we can't actually just toss aside what Christ said about adultery. We have to have a juridical process to determine when marriages are, are, you know, when they're marriages and when they're not. We have to defend marriage and, you know, we can't have um, adulterers or serial adulterers receiving Holy Communion and just say, well, we, we tolerate it but don't accept it, which was kind of the, the, the proposal um, offered by, by Walter Casper. You're going to see this in the next month, Casper's book coming out more and more and more and more and more. And people talk about merciful solutions because anybody then who wants to defend the faith is going to be painted as being against mercy. And that's going to be the, that's going to be the, the tactic of, the, of that side. On the other hand, uh, Ignatius Press is soon going to release a book in which there are uh, essays by five cardinals and, and several other uh, uh, theologians um, about marriage, and it's called Remaining in the Truth of Christ. And I warmly, I warmly urge you to get this book. It's on pre, you can pre-order it now at a big discount. Um, and you can use a link on my blog, as a matter of fact. So um, just look up fatherz.com and you'll see a link up there to where a post where I describe this thing. And I know um, something of the, con the, the, the people, I know the people who wrote, you know, a lot of the content and I, it's, it's going to be spectacular. So there are going to be measures and countermeasures. It's going to be a, 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 a sort of a sort of a, a ballet of suggestions. Okay, and they will Svengali-like try to convince you that if you defend the church's teaching, you are the enemy of mercy. And that's what we have to, we have to confound all those expectations and um, uh, accusations. Some of them will be outright accusations. So and Father Z is conducting a war on mercy. I've already heard that one. So, um, yes, sir. No, we don't ignore them. Uh, but when we talk about the faithful, you know, this is, the, the, my, I had limited scope in what I could you know, present up here, but when we talk about the, a sense of the faith of the faithful, and we want to define our terms, and we have to determine who the faithful are, um, would, um, do we consider the, consider the Orthodox to be the faithful? Do we consider Protestants to be the faithful? Um, how about uh, Catholics who are heretics? Do we consider them to be the faithful? Uh, St. Augustine would say no, uh, even though they would be baptized. St. Augustine would say no. He wouldn't consider them the faithful. Now that's you know, reaching back into you know, my patristic tool bag. But yeah, we have to, somewhere along the line we have to uh, we have to ask ourselves, you know, I did make one distinction about both inside and outside the church. Well, I think there's been also been a lot of 
a lot of confusion about what being in the church means. It does, is, everyone, is everyone who is baptized automatically in the church? Well, in a sense, you're baptized into the body of Christ if you're validly baptized. You have some relationship with the church. But I think that my presupposition for a talk like this is formal membership in the Catholic Church, whether it's in the, the Latin church on the one side or the Eastern churches. That's another, uh, this is another dynamic in which we use that same image of both lungs breathing together, right, a conspiratio. Uh, but yeah, you, you raise a good question, but I, I think I, I, for the sake of this evening, I'm going to say no, the Protestants are not the faithful in this sense. Uh, the Orthodox know they're separated. Uh, you know, in another in another context or another talk, I think I might you know have a little different uh, a different approach to it. Certainly, they they believe a lot of the same things that we believe. You know, their core doctrines that we believe together. But I'm really not talking to them tonight. You know, put me in an ecumenical put me in an ecumenical setting, and uh, see what happens. I don't know. You know. Yeah, I'm a former Lutheran, so I'm. Uh, one last question, please. Right. Uh, today there's a lot of discussion of people that talk about religion. They say that they're, they're spiritual, but they're not religious. <laughs> Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time talking about that particular thing to this person on the street, I think, you know, that's just a longer discussion. Uh, but in, a, in another context, um, let me just morph that into, a, into something that we're going to be seeing also within the church itself. Uh, I mentioned uh, the National Catholic Reporter and the... Um, Leadership Conference of, of uh, Women Religious. Uh, in the pages of the National uh, Schismatic Reporter, you will often find a dichotomy of the institutional church and the prophetic church. This is the same kind of thing going on. This is another manifestation of I'm I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious, or I'm, you know, whatever it is that they say. You know, it's just gobbledygook. You know, basically, you don't, how do you, how do you, how do you deal with gobbledygook? You know, you get stuck in your hands, and you can't, yeah. So, you know, it, it, it's better sometimes just not to deal with it at all. Oh, is that, is that so? Okay, well, you're spiritual, not religious. Have a nice day. I'd invite you to come to the, uh, um, I, invite you to come to uh, Sacred Heart Church at 10.30 for the principal mass and we can talk about it at Coffee and Donuts later on. And, um, but uh, this, you're, when, you, when, you see, when you see the words in articles at NCR or you know, other publications or sources similar to it or in that, in that side of the spectrum, where you start seeing institutional church and they are creating an, a, a, a different position over and against the institutional church, as if the institution, that generally means hierarchy, is, is subordinate to our prophetic role. We have a prophetic role in the church, right? I think we have to be uh, uh, aware that that's, what, that's the same kind of thing going on. You know, it's really interesting that some um, trads will do the same thing. Uh, they'll start talking about eternal Rome as opposed to Rome and the Vatican of the modernists, right? It's almost the same kind of thing, just turned inside, you know, the sock turned inside out. It's, so... Um, I suppose you could always say that uh, um, when the when the people at the National Catholic Reporter do it, or you know, wherever you can call it a maybe a Lefevreism of the left or something, there. but um, turn the sock inside out on them a little bit. I hope you know. I what would you say to them? There are no good one-liners. You have to figure out you know who they are and what they're doing, and 
you know, why they're, why you're talking to them at all, you know, I mean, why, no, why? Right, is it because, you know, is it because, is it, is it because they overheard you say something in a coffee shop or is it, you know, are you having a serious discussion with a coworker? Those are two different contexts, you know, with one you might talk more, with the other one you say, hey, have a nice day and go on your way, right? So, all right, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, descendat super vos et maniat semper. Amen. Good evening. <laughs>